in this episode we'll be talking about what is the craftsmanship in service design, how can you design the project experience of our clients and finally about service design in the Middle East. So if you're interested in that, keep watching. And here is the guest of this episode. I am Mahmoud Abdurrahman and this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to create more people-oriented services. And we know that this is important, but also comes with some interesting challenges. So that's why we talk on the show about topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're also interested in, know that we bring a fresh new episode every two weeks on Thursday. If you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you enjoyed this episode and would like to show your support, click that like button or leave a short comment. It lets me know that the things we're doing here are appreciated by people like you. My guest in this episode is Mahmoud Abderrahman. Mahmoud is the managing part of Hude, and Hude is the first service design agency in Saudi Arabia. He has a strong passion and interest in how to scale service design to the level of families. In the next 30 minutes or so, Mahmoud will be talking about the craftsmanship and service design, how to design the project experience of our clients and about the state of service design in the Middle East. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. And in case you'd like to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to soundcloud.com slash service design show where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Mahmoud. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Nice being here with you. It's, uh, I'm uh, super excited again to have someone from uh, what I would say the Middle East and you're in Saudi Arabia. Um, Mahmoud, can you tell me a little bit, how did you get involved in service design? Where did you meet the term? Um, so I was interested in product innovation. Uh, that's back in 2008, 2009. I was looking for a uh, master's to further develop my uh, knowledge in the field. And I stumbled on the program in Laurier University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and I applied, I attended a few courses as non-degree student and then got enrolled in the master's program. So the first day I actually sat in a, in a classroom about service design, that was January 29, uh, sorry, 2010. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. And and um, how how was your first encounter with service design? What did you think when you first met the term? Uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, I it had more uh, of um, like new tools, etc., that would bring to me rather than I would say I I had in my toolbox. So I have come from um, project management and marketing strategies background. Um, so the whole uh, set of tools in the design field, uh, it was uh, quite new to me. Um, and I remember it was, so the first person I ever learned anything from about service design that was Miko, Miko Paivistu, uh, that was in Lauria. Um, and I remember uh, mm -hmm. Miko said, I will, uh, so I will, teach you guys about what I, the tools that I know and I will be expecting during uh, the course that you also come up with new tools and I think that was quite motivating and that happened during the course. Uh, so actually I have, uh, at that time I remember I designed a new tool called Concept Blending and Miko was quite kind and nice that he taught it uh, in the course in the next intake for the students in the following year. <laughs> That's 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 the way I like to hear it. So you develop you develop your own design too. Yeah, that was then, and and I think that's something that we have to always to, to to always keep doing. I mean, everyone is really sharing the knowledge that they have with us, but doesn't mean that we stop there. And there's so much to learn from. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So that was the beginning, and then I finished the masters uh, oh. during the years I was working in incubation innovation areas, but. Uh, quite far from service line innovation. 
I was trying to apply as much as possible, um, build the interest in the region. And then I moved to, to service design consultancy four years ago. So this is when I started the service design team in Aramis that's currently huge. Cool. Uh, Mahmoud, we have three super interesting topics uh, we're, we want to talk about in this episode. So let's quickly move on. Um, and you have uh, the, the famous service design show question starters. And I have your topics here. And now that we were talking about service design education, let me start with um, the first topic. And um, it's the topic of craftsmanship. Do you have a question started that goes along with this topic? Yeah, so I have why. So why discussing craftsmanship in service design? And I think... It... And what is craftsmanship in service design? Well, I think it would be... Um, something that everyone would easily expect, but because it's not quite discussed, I would say there are reasons why we need to discuss that. I think it is, um, in, an, in essence, touching us as, as designers. Um, we want to always be better and we want to advance. Um, we want to feel that we are doing something during our career and leaving impact and legacy as well. Um, we want to leave uh, examples, so we want to teach through examples and uh, reaching a level of craftsmanship is something that you do that uh, through. Um, the question is quite easy to answer in many other fields, uh, even as close as product design. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, probably there are uh, areas where um, deliberate practice is much known, as in sports, etc. These questions are quite easy. I mean, the standard you are trying to reach is already set for you, and you are trying to work towards that. But in service design, it's, it's quite more complex, um, but it doesn't mean that we avoid it, uh, because I believe it is what fuels the souls of us and the souls of uh, our colleagues, uh, on our team members. It is what makes them feel satisfied at the end of a course, being it. A so what you're saying is that the discussion about craftsmanship in service design is partly difficult because uh, the standards haven't been set yet or are not clear? Yeah, and uh, I think there are so so there is there is a reason why uh, we feel that discussion of craftsmanship in service design uh, is difficult. So mm -hmm. service design is collaborative in nature, right? Uh, it is not about you yourself. If you if you want to say, oh, that's an act of craftsmanship or level of craftsmanship, uh, how can you really reach that? How can you really uh, influence that and make it happen? If it is so collaborative, it's about you, your mm -hmm. colleagues, your clients, your clients, staff, etc. Um, it has also many parameters. It's very complex, so it's quite difficult. Um, and then um, you can never guarantee the success of development and implementation of your concept. So if you stop at the design phase, that I mean, and you are never there on daily basis when the service encounters are happening, then how can you really make sure that the craftsmanship uh, is there. So probably I think we need to start with defining what what could be the craftsmanship and service design. Like what could be the views of craftsmanship and service design. And I would like to bring in the ultimate example that I think and I'll pull out some frames from what we have here in the office. So I don't know if you can see that clearly, but this is someone who is quite happy with something that he, he has in his, uh, his hand. So he's showcasing a touch point in reality. Um, okay. And, uh, okay. And, and I have another photo of that same person who, while he's clapping, uh, out of excitement. So the, the, the point here is if we want to um, assess and evaluate the level of craftsmanship, it is, the, is in the final outcome. If the customer of the service that you have designed thinks it is craftsmanship, then that's craftsmanship. But there are so many things that go in there, right? So I think I want to break it down into two different things. So let's differentiate between mastery and craftsmanship, because I think that makes things easier for us. So, so mastery is, is about reaching a level of skill in what you are doing. But you know, it's only that you are quite skilled in, in doing that. Craftsmanship adds to that the element of application. 
So you are quite skilled in using the tools, following the process, etc., etc., and you are applying that as well. Interestingly enough, uh, when I was looking at the topic of craftsmanship, uh, Google says it, ha it has been high, highly used and most used, and you can see the curve has been declining since then, in 1950s. It has actually been less used by 60% since then. I don't know really what's mm -hmm. the reason behind it. Is it more about uh, newer terms came in there, or is it that's not so much discussion about detail orientation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's, a, that, that's an area to look at. So let's, let's look at, like, if we can't really and easily reach the final results of craftsmanship, and I will come to a few things around how we can probably achieve that, then let's look at interim views. So I think we have the tools mastery. So if you think someone is a master of service design, he knows how to use the tools. Um, we have the process mastery. You can develop the right process for every project. Yep. And then we have the outcome mastery. When I see the outcomes, I'm quite happy, uh, quite happy with them. But then probably yeah, we can yeah, add yeah, yeah. a number so, of... Mahmoud, um, my, my, my question would be, uh, um, th there is still a lot to explore around this topic. And if you had to pick one thing that you could explore tomorrow around service design craftsmanship, what, what would that be? What, would it, what question would you like to explore? Um, the question would be how can we probably uh, make it happen? So enable the end result of craftsmanship. So, I mean, we will be trying to do the interim mastery uh, frame or, or definition, probably. But we want to also be, we want to also see the results of the craftsmanship to the end. And that's a problem because we are always yeah, disengaging yeah, from the yeah. organization after the design. Um, so there are things that you can still do while you are trying to master the tools, et cetera, et cetera. And a few things I, I, I feel very fascinated with Mark is when I see some jobs being more like a performance. Uh, like in so many fields, you, you feel you see a person who is actually doing his job, but you feel like it, it is a level of skill and mastery to being a uh, performance. Um, and have always been inspired by, by these people. You know, why do, do they reach such levels and, uh, and we don't? And I think if you would break down everything that we do on a daily basis, do you think your, how you handle a meeting would feel like a performance? Do you think how you... You, you do insights uh, and you do research, et cetera, et cetera, could feel like a performance. When I see you doing something, I feel like this guy is actually delivering a performance for, for, for everyone to, uh, to see. Um, but then if I want to speak about the realization mastery. So how do you really make sure that whatever you did, assume that you have the mastery and you, you have that craftsmanship in the work you did, how can you make sure it is realized until the end? Um, so if you can't be present in every encounter, can you minimize deviation? So can you actually set some touch points um, that could probably be the least for the delivery to be deviating from while is the delivery is happening? So normally you would find that um, digital touch points are much more consistent in delivery versus some human touch points, for example. Um, Another aspect I want to look at is uh, designing for the most Im possibly implementable. So while you are trying to dream so far, there is an element that you're not going to be involved in, which is actually the transition between the reality of today and the design that you want to make tomorrow. So if you want uh, your design to be meeting somehow the reality that's happening in the future, probably you need to design for that, so what is what could be probably uh, delivered now? Um, one element is always neglected is designing for the transition and behavior. So you design this uh, experience and the blueprint and operations behind it. How would people really change? There, people don't have configuration files that you can change some values, and then next day you have they have amazing habits and amazing spirit and different culture, etc. So how can you really embed and, and extend your design into the areas where we actually look behind, okay, for, so this is the design we want to see happening. Can we now start designing for it to actually 
uh, emerge in the organization. Yeah. And I think yeah. if you yeah. do that, then you have to look beyond your design. So you have to design for your design to actually happen. And then you need to see them yeah, as yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to de design like the, the, uh, the context. You're designing the context and the conditions to which your design can be realized. And a lot of topics uh, we, we could still further explore, but well, let's, 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 let's leave it for the Christmas shit at this. And uh, so, Mahmoud, uh, let's move on to a second topic uh, because time is uh, flying by. And uh, the second topic is uh, one that hasn't been on the show uh, from what I know, and it's called Project Experience. Do you have a question started that goes along with this one? Yeah, so who are we designing for? So we are most of the time designing for our uh, clients' clients. Uh, there is, this is the reason why we are being yes, no, no, no. hired, yeah. etc. And uh, the client is all, most of the time neglected in that process. We do it naturally. Um, I mean, we think we need to build more engagement, etc., etc. but we don't spend much time or efforts or we don't plan to that much more proactively. And I think it is simply the act of designing for the project life cycle and the actual experience of your client as he goes throughout uh, the process. So why is that important? Uh, I think it is important because uh, it helps you for each project to make sure that you are uh, attending to your client in his position at the moment with his goals, etc., in the right way. Uh, it helps you also build the interest uh, in his circle as well as in the organization and help him also get the buy-in um, much more. And then you will find in some projects it's actually... So, so what, what, what you're actually talking about is the emotional journey that our clients go through, like the... We should have a, a customer, a, a client journey map. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. So, uh, so you need to think about the journey map of your client, uh, their touch points and service moments as they go through. And I think yeah. So they are yeah. only engaged with the, like uh, how exciting it gets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then beyond this novelty element, when they are used to the concept, there are some other elements that you and some other moments you have to design for. But when you actually start to considering scaling that up, you will find that in larger organizations, and I'm speaking about giantly large organizations, that becomes uh, something uh, very essential. Because the time you spend with your client and the journey you go with, you need to scale that up really quickly and very, very fast. Uh, you will see that you need engagement from someone who is in a remote area. You will need to recruit people for research in some other parts of the organizations. You don't have time to onboard everyone. You, you don't have capacity to do this. Probably some in some of the projects you may have to even onboard some uh, audience that you can't easily reach. And then you would start to see, okay, like, hmm. how can we make sure that we are actually not only about the emotional part of people feeling interested, but how can we make sure that the, the design goals of everyone who is touched by this project is actually, is actually reflected in our work and actually reflected in our designs. And then it becomes more like, like more of communication, but on a larger scale, but within the organization. So what would you say is uh, the biggest challenge when designing a project experience? Uh, normally, so the client is always, because he's engaging with service design agency, he's expecting you to be walking the talk. So he's saying, okay, I invited you mm. to design the experience of my client. I want to make sure that this is being reflected in how we deal with things. And he's expecting you to always do things differently, right? Um, he, he wouldn't necessarily see that you have very limited resources and you need to put them towards the end design rather than beautifying everything and making everything much more proactively thought and, uh, uh, and in details, etc. Um, so that's a part that's where you will not really have enough, uh, I would say, resourcing put uh, to that part while you still have to, uh, to deliver it. And, and um have you put this into your own practice? So have you been thinking and actually designing more project experiences in your uh, work? And if so, what would you say is one best practice that you could share with us? What is something that works really well? Yeah. 
So we have been trying with few things uh, here and there. Um, for example, looking into transforming um, a project report into a newsletter. Uh, so that's more nicely, uh, like more visual, it has better content, and people like to engage with it uh, much more. Uh, thinking of how you'll be keeping your client engaged and uh, in multi-channels about the, the project uh, without, and making it more of sort of attending to his uh, needs when he needs to know something rather than demanding and, you know, and pushy. Um, mm -hmm. And then in larger organizations, we, we had to actually go much, much beyond this. So we had to look into stakeholder profiling. Uh, we had to go into segmentation, uh, design uh, drivers. Did for you make personas of your own clients? Uh, yes, so we did. Uh, so in, so in some cases, you don't really have to make personas because if you are designing for the CEO, for example, <laughs> it's quite clear. Uh, some uh, some very yeah. like uh, key figures in the organization, etc. You can also probably uh, segment them much easier. Um, but then you have to, and when you do that, you start to understand what is it really that they are expecting. It's not really about uh, being nicer and more visual. No, it, it is that this is the metric he will be looking at things. If you want to speak to him, this is what you have to touch on. This is the KPI he's measured on. If you want to go and talk to him, you want to reserve a meeting with him. This is what you have to talk about. Anything else he will not really care about, you know? So being able to really understand the goals of everyone when they are engaging, what is it that they are looking for? And you're, are you using just the basic tools that we know in service design that we use for the end user, or do you think we need some special kind of tools? So we have designed internally some um, canvases for designing for, for such uh, engagements. Um, we have done um, more like project uh, level and also individual service level if you are working on like a pipeline of services within a larger project. So how could that uh, look like? We had to develop sometimes some, some uh, what we call enablers, like what can you do really with them? So if you want to give them something, if you want to roll out something, what could mm. that be? And there are a few things mm. that are in the post element not so high, but on the impact element they are quite good. Um, one of them is what I shared here, uh, and I have a full article about that. So it is called Customer Advocacy uh, Posters. So it's basically about um, capturing the person while he is engaged in something and having a quote with, with that and creating a poster for him out of this. And immediately it connects with something that encapsulates uh, a mission and a value that he believes needs to be delivered. And it reminds him on daily basis when he sees that hanged in his office, et cetera, et cetera, that Mm. Uh, this is mm. what I really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really good. So, uh, I guess if people would like to share their ideas and learn more about this, they probably just can reach out to you, right? right. I'll, I'll make sure that your contact details are in the description of the uh, of the video. So, I have one post about the customer advocacy portal uh, poster. Sorry, and probably some discussion can start. Yeah, and that that link will be in the description. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a super interesting topic and uh, it's definitely not discussed enough in the design service design field at this moment. So uh, we should, we should uh, I'll, I'll do my best to spend more attention uh, at, in the show at this. So, Mahmoud, the third topic. I'm, I'm rushing it through because time is scarce and there's so much to discuss. So the third topic uh, and I'm really curious about this one, it's called service design in the region. Um, I haven't defined what the region is, but uh, maybe you can. Yeah, so, um, so I don't know, I would say how. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so how is the landscape? Uh, how does the landscape look like? So region, I think I would say no, it's I'm, I'm, limited I'm, to yeah. the GCC, uh, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be much uh, much easier. Um, so uh, how the landscape looks like at the moment, I would say education, we need much more education about design in large and then service design in particular. It's quite a new topic anyway worldwide, uh, but we don't yet have structured programs around it. Uh, there are some in the training, but not in, in the academic education. Uh, consultancy, there are some emerging organizations as uh, agencies and such. Uh, I think we need much more, and then there is the issue of talents. Do we have talents, uh, or is it uh, quite difficult? So I think we have to, to work on, on both uh, of them. 
I think there is so much need, but not yet necessarily translated into demand. Um, so you will rarely find people coming and asking you and approaching you for service design um, uh, scope. We have, we have been suffering from that in the beginning. Now we do really uh, like receive such requests. Um, but in general, you'll be like speaking about service design to could be to the uh, customer experience manager, it could be products and services manager, it could be to the IT director, it could be, I mean, depending on what engagement you are engaged in. Um, so this is how, how it looks uh, at the moment. So I think the opportunity is quite, quite large for everyone. And if you look, uh, are there any things that are specific to the region that you think uh, make it suitable or interesting for service design. So let me give an example. I've talked to uh, uh, quite a few guests from Latin America and uh, there is a whole service mindset in Latin America or the service mindset is different in Latin America compared to Europe and the US. How does that play out in, 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 yeah, in your situation? So I think in sequence because uh, business process management is is looking at the operational element of things and has been quite a large wave before we look into service design in the region. So people continue to mix these. And I think one of the things that we have to always do is to uh, build the relevance so people understand how they actually play together and then also highlight the differences. So so how do we do that? And, and we had to actually like build the whole um, you know uh, content around that to always be able to to answer the question as uh, as it emerged. But there are some few things that are also related to the level of ambition for people and probably what they are expecting. So one interesting thing people would, would probably need to know uh, is that unlike how it is worldwide that you are told that the more finished the prototype, the less feedback you get and that you need to make it much more raw, I would say it's the other way around. So the more finished the prototype <laughs> and more polished, etc., etc the more feedback you'll be able to get. Uh, the, less, the less it will actually be provoking any feedback or taking somehow uh, seriously. And that had to, we had to actually redesign our process in specific areas around that to make sure that we are always getting the feedback uh, that's expected. Um, sometimes there- So how do you, because, but that's, that's a really crucial thing. How do, you, how do you fix that? Because quick and fast prototype is, Typing is for me such a key element of the design process. And when you have to work with finished prototypes, then you lose a lot of the value. So how does that work? So I think we are using other ways uh, to do it. So when, we're, when we want to make sure, so, okay. So there are different objectives and rules for prototypes, right? So uh, you have prototypes that are made to, uh, to communicate. Uh, things you have prototypes that are are made to test, and then there are, we have prototypes that are rolling out for production, and they have different names for them. Uh, so when we want uh -huh. to communicate something, we would rather not do a wireframe, for example, if you are speaking about the digital bit, and find other ways to do it, uh, because we notice that wireframes are not necessarily, for example, taking that seriously at that stage. People, if you give them finished screens, etc., they will be much more. Uh, willing and much more responsive, you know, and giving you uh, feedback uh, on that. So, and that continues for actually everything. So, all over the project, people are expecting stunning visuals, um, quite nicely finished uh, outcomes throughout the process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, people have to really uh, attend to that element and, make, and take it into consideration. Uh, it could sometimes not be about the content, but it's more about how the content is presented. Does it tie in with the with the culture, or can you explain? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, there is, yeah. So people are always expecting higher quality in things, and then accordingly, they feel not uh -huh. taking so seriously if they see low quality uh, outcomes. Okay. And also, okay. you need to be much more visual and interactive in your outcomes rather than longer documents that would require long time in reading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And that yeah. that would also be another tip that people need to take into consideration. Well, I, I, I actually. Uh, in the, in the most recent thread report that came out, one of the three topics that I talked about was culturalizing design methods. And that's pretty interesting what you're also talking about. You know, we, uh, 
a lot of the things we know about the design process and the design tools are based on what we think and feel in the West, you know, uh, Europe and the uh, United States. But sort of I'm getting the feeling it doesn't work out that well in uh, all of the, uh, the rest of the world. So culturalizing design methods is, is I think, a really interesting trend. I, I totally agree, 100% agree. Um, yeah. Go ahead. And the question that I, uh, I, I have right now is, these were the topics that uh, we just explored, but what is the thing, what is the question that you would like to ask the viewers or the listeners of this episode? Yeah, so if in reflection on all the topics that I spoke about, and you saw how quite uh, broad and long the, the whole life cycle is, where would you draw the borders and boundaries around service time? Where does it really end? I'm not so much worried about where it starts, uh, but like, do you think the end of the delivering the outcomes of your project is the end? Do you think uh, being there while it's being developed or implemented is there, rolling out, uh, being there on a daily basis? I mean, that element, I think it needs to be uh, further discussed, and I would be interested to hear the views on that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And this has been a topic uh, also uh, quite a few times on the show. So I mean, can we better understand or agree or disagree on the boundaries of service design? So uh, leave your thoughts in the comments, people. Mahmoud, thank you. Um, thank you for your time. It's time to wrap up this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, Mark. What is your biggest takeaway from this episode? And which tools or methods do you use while designing a good project experience? Share your thoughts and ideas in the comments. And remember, more people like you watch these episodes and your comment might just be the thing that helps them to have their next meaningful breakthrough. If you're interested in learning more, head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where we'll be offering courses that dig deeper into the topics we talk about. I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and see you then.